I take you to be my wedded husband. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold. From this day forward. For better. For worse. For richer. For poorer. In sickness. And in health. To love. And to cherish. Till death do us part. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this Sunday morning. It is great to have you here for week two of our series, Fight For It. Can we give it up for our West Wilmington family and our family over at RCA, Recovery Centers of America? We're glad you're here. We're glad you're with us tuning in. Pastor Paul holding it down in West Wilmington. Well, we're going to dive into this week's series, continuing this idea and focus on relationships and how to win in our relationships and last week pastor mark he kicked us off uh with a bang in so many ways and it was super bowl weekend how many enjoyed your super bowl festivities last weekend some of you like five people all you philadelphia fans andy reed got his first super bowl win who's excited for andy yeah well pastor mark he kicked off our series and he talked about conflict and how this idea of that all of us want what we have, what we don't have, and that other person, the he or she in our life, they can't give it to us. They, they can't provide what we need. Only God can. Only God can give us lasting joy. Only God can give us hope. Only God can give us healthy relationships. And we're going to continue to dive in to the topic of relationships and what makes them and what breaks them. Now, many of you don't know this about me, but back in high school, I used to be a wrestler. I wrestled for one season and one season only. And I was pretty good, I'll be honest. I was undefeated in my one year of wrestling, but it was, it was cut short and I didn't get a chance to get a photo of that experience. So I thought, well, I'm gonna use my limited Photoshop skills and kind of paint a picture for you of what it would have looked like for me back in high school when I was a wrestler. There you go. I got the eyebrow down. You can see that the resemblance is very clear. Uh, the Rock has a lot of work to do if he wants to look like this, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but my wrestling career was a little bit short, and I gotta be honest with you, the, the main reason why it was short was because I just couldn't see myself squeezing into one of those little men's leotards, you know? I don't know, it's just not my thing, getting on the floor, rolling around with another dude in a leotard who's sweaty trying to take me out. That's just not me. So to each his own, if you like wrestling, you do you. But my, my career was short-lived, but it did teach me quite a few things. It taught me what it meant to be ready, to get, to get ready for my first match, to get physically ready. And I, had, I played other sports. I played football. I played baseball. None of those sports prepared me for the level of physical training that was necessary for me to be ready to wrestle my first match. You see, before I ever stepped in the ring, there was a process, there was training. I had to, to build my stamina. I had to get ready. And our practices usually were pretty tiresome. Each day we would practice a new technique. And some of those techniques had really interesting names. So I thought I'd share a few of them with you. Well, that picture just keeps coming. Funk roll to Seeger. That is a technique in wrestling. Believe it or not, Google it, look it up. That's a technique that we learned. The shuck, that sounds fun. The dresser dump, always a good one. Fireman's carry, front headlock torture technique. Little brother, if you're watching online, I'm sorry. You got this technique used on you way too many times. And then lastly, the window high crotch takedown. Let me tell you, you don't want anything to do with that move right there. It is not a pleasant one. But on top of focusing on individual techniques, we had these workouts that we did every single day called core workouts. You ever heard of them? Yeah, they're horrible. 
You work out this general region right here, and as you can tell, it's been a while since I've had a core workout. They're torturous. I don't like them. Sit-ups, planks, bicycle crunches. I thought my coach was trying to kill me. But here's what I learned, that if I was going to be fit for the fight, I had to be willing to do what it took to be ready for the match. I had to get my core strong. In fact, all the techniques that we learned centered around me having a core strong. And if my core wasn't strong, I couldn't, couldn't make those techniques happen. I couldn't be successful. I couldn't win. And I think this is true a lot in our relationships as well. If I'm not intentional about developing and working on my core that's here and here, it's impossible for me to win when it comes to our relationships, to my relationships. I've got to get my core strong. I can't be successful in creating healthy relationships without working on my core. It's more difficult if I don't. It's, it takes more time if I don't. And some of us, we have the wrong techniques when it comes to our relationships. We've had the wrong kind of training. We've been focused on the wrong things. And no matter what you believe about God or the Bible, we all come into relationships having some form of training, some technique that we've learned, some situation in life that life has taught us, and we bring them into our relationships. They come from a lot of different places. I think the primary place they come from is the family that we grew up with or the people that took care of us and guided us as we grew up. And, and, and some of them may have been great habits that we learned, techniques that we learned from them that we could have had a healthy and loving family, but some of them could have been negative as well. Maybe we grew up in a family where they avoided conflict. So now in our lives, we've picked up the habit that whenever conflict comes, we just try to avoid it. We try to pretend that it's not there. And that's the technique that we bring into our relationships. Or maybe you saw a model for you when, when conflict came, a family member that got angry and raised their voice. Why does my voice get so high when I get angry? And they throw things around the room. And that, that, that's the technique that we bring into our relationships because that's what we saw or maybe maybe it's a it's a it's a technique that we saw that whenever conflicts happen the person just went away they disappeared and now in our relationships when conflict happens we're quick to, to run away we're quick to just get out of the room get away from it we just abandon the situation altogether and that's the technique that we bring into our relationships and then we grow up and we have our own experiences with people that teach us techniques on forming relationships. We get into a friendship, that friendship that we poured our heart into, that person that we love like a brother, and we find out that they stabbed us in the back and they were disloyal. And now, now we've picked up the technique of mistrust. Or maybe it's somebody that you worked for, someone you respected, someone that you looked to as a mentor and you found out that they did you wrong. Or maybe the work environment wasn't a healthy one. And now, man, now every time you get into a situation where there's a figure that has authority in your life, you buck against the authority, you push back against it. And that's the technique that you bring into your relationships. So these experiences that we've had, they create a framework for our relationships, some good and some bad. And we try to build healthy relationships. We, we try to build healthy friendships. We try to build working relationships. We try to build a marriage. We try, try to build healthy relationships with our children. But can I tell you this, that you don't just get healthy relationships. You've got to fight for them. You gotta fight for those healthy relationships in your life. And honestly, many of us are doing the best we can with what we've got, man. We find ourselves using the wrong techniques and we, we don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. We're left wondering, man, why is this relationship so hard? Why is it so confusing? Why is it so stressed? And we're asking the question, man, why doesn't it work? Shouldn't it be easier than this? Shouldn't our relationships be easier than this? I'm doing the best I got with what I got, right? So then we end up going into these relationships that are valuable to us, relationships that are worth us fighting for without being ready, having learned the wrong techniques, and honestly having a really weak core. So we, we switch gears, and then instead of building our, we start building our relationship on questions like this. Well, what feels right? 
what feels right. I'm going to build my relationship on what feels right. So if you make me feel right, then this must be right. Or if you say things that make me feel good, this must be the right friendship. You must be a good friend. So we, so we make it on what it feels and we establish a relationship on what makes us happy. And I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to, ha to be happy, that he wants you to be sad. That'd be a horrible relationship. But I'm just proposing that, that maybe it shouldn't be what's at the core of your relationships. And here's the reason why I'm giving you these specific examples, because I can't tell you how many times I've sat across the table from someone whose reason they gave me, the reason that they wanted out of a relationship or that their relationship uh, blew up is because they said, you know what, they just didn't make me happy anymore. It just didn't feel right. They don't just make, they don't make me feel good anymore. You see, when we make the mistake of building our relationships on what it feels right and build it on what makes us happy and we build it on what's in it for me, can I tell you, our, 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 our feelings cannot be dictators. They're just indicators. We can't be dictated by our feelings because if we're dictated by our feelings, then we'll chase after a fleeting thing that's never meant to bring us true happiness or fulfillment. Our feelings. So when we stop asking this question, man, what makes me happy and start realizing that there's a, a better way to view our relationships, a better way to train, a better way to be fit for the fight, then real change can start to happen in our lives and can start to happen in our relationships. Here's what the book of Proverbs says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Notice it doesn't say to trust your feelings. It doesn't say to trust your emotions. It doesn't say to even trust your own heart. It says trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, if you're not sure what you believe about the Bible, I want you to just stick with me for a couple of moments here because I believe some of these principles really can help you and help your relationships in your life. But what happens when the reason I get into the relationship, which was that, what was in it for me? What happens when there's nothing in it for me anymore? What happens? You end up forfeiting the fight. You forfeit the fight. You have relationships and friendships that are broken. You have working relationships that are fragmented. You have parent-child relationships that are damaged. You get marriages that turn into a draw where both parties go separate ways. You forfeit the fight. So I'm just proposing that when it comes to fighting for your relationships, there's a better technique. I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to be happy. Hear me, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that maybe happiness shouldn't be the foundation that your relationship is built on. I'm just saying that what makes me feel good shouldn't be what the core of your relationship is. That what's in it for me can't be the building block of a healthy relationship. There's something deeper. There's something different that everything hinges on. The core. So what is it? What is it that needs our attention? That thing that's so vital for us to focus on when it comes to our relationships. What is that thing that's going to get me fit for the fight? For the relationships in my life that really matter. The ones I want to fight for. Ready to, to be able to take on challenges that come with relationships. Can I tell you, it's pretty simple. It all starts with trust. It all starts with trust. And this is what I found to be true in my life. When we trust in the one above us, we can handle everything around us. When we trust in the one above us, we can handle everything around us. The foundation, the core of every relationship starts with trust. Whether you're a Christian or not, can I tell you, the trust is where relations begin and end. Relationships begin and end with trust. And it's true for all types of relationships. It's true for your relationship with other people. It's true for the way that you view yourself. It's true for the way you view your relationship with God. The core that we need to train is learning to trust. Learning to trust. And there's several facets of trust that, that we need. There's, there's trust that looks outward, trust that looks inward, and trust that looks Upward. Now, some of you, I know what you're thinking. Alarms are going off in your head. You're like, I don't trust people. Do you know the people I know? 
Yeah, I know some of those same people. They're in your circle of concern, not your circle of control. Because when it comes down to it, we realize that we can't control people. So they become a concern in our lives. But here's the deal. The only thing you can control is you. Is you. So you can choose what you extend. See, whenever you're in a relationship, you have a choice of what you're going to extend. You have two choices. You can extend suspicion or you can extend trust. Now, the level of difficulty for, for you at which it is to extend trust is based on your circumstances. I get it. Some of you have had some rough experiences in your life. I'm not trying to downplay that at all. All I want you to say is that only you control you. Only you control you, and you determine what you extend. So the relationships, the healthy relationships that you want so desperately in your life, can I tell you, they're, they're, they're made or broken on what you're willing to extend. Are you going to extend trust? Are you going to extend suspicion? Are you one of those people that's suspicious about everybody waiting for the hammer to fall, waiting for somebody to fail you? One of the writers in the New Testament encouraged us this way. He said, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Are you going to extend trust the way that you would want to be trusted? Are you going to think better of others? Now, I understand that it's difficult because you're extending trust to humans, right? And how many know humans aren't perfect? How many know you're not perfect either? There we go. There's some truth. We're not perfect. So here's what happens in life, that because we're human, we often create a gap in our life and a gap in our relationships. And a gap is this. It's the distance between where I am or what I said I'm going to do and what I actually do and who I am. And when someone creates a gap in your life, you have a choice as to what you're going to fill that gap with. You can either fill it with trust or you can fill it with suspicion. Now, I would propose to you that the people in your life, if you're going to build healthy, life-giving relationships, you've got to start with being a person that extends trust. In other words, you're going to believe the best about other people. You're going to start there. Well, you don't know how many times they've burnt me. Yeah, I do. I've been burnt. That's a different conversation. But if I have reason to trust and I have no reason not to trust, then I'm going to choose to fill that gap that's created with trust. I'm not saying that you become a doormat for people. I'm not saying that you keep extending trust to someone who's proven to be an untrustworthy person. What I'm saying is that your default setting is extending trust. Extend trust. Let that be your de default. Several years ago, when my wife and I were living in Florida, we were dog sitting for a friend of ours. And uh, we love dogs. We have two dogs ourselves. And my wife was taking care of the dog one day, and she needed to run up to the office to grab something. So she decided to take this dog with her in the car. And so she got to the office. She left the car running outside, left the, the dog in the car. And needless to say, she came back out to the car, and this little guy had left her a surprise. Good old number two all over our rear seats. And it was bad, y'all. Let me just tell you, it was nasty. It was bad. And Carrie, in the commotion, she, she starts cleaning everything up. She, she, she cleans it out. She, she comes home. And later that evening, we, we decide we want to go out and get some dinner. So I get in the car. I'm like, what in the world happened in this car? So she fills me in on what happened. I'm like, all right, I'm going to give it a shot and clean it in. So I start cleaning. I'm spraying air fresher. Now the car smells like new car scent and dog do. <laughs> that smell ain't going away. So I'm like, man, I'm going I'm to just leave the windows down. We left the windows down in that car for a week. That smell wasn't going nowhere. Finally, we're like, we're going to take this thing to a detailer. We're going we're gonna to spend a couple hundred bucks. We're going to have somebody clean this thing out. Maybe they can do a little bit better than we can do. So we take it to the detail shop, and we get there. We park the car. I start cleaning some of our stuff out of the car, trying to get it ready so nothing's in the way of the detailers. And I open the trunk, y'all, and my life was changed forever. 
what hit me still haunts my nightmares. In the back of our trunk was a trash bag of the surprise that our little friend had left us baking in 98 degree Florida weather for a week. Wonder why we couldn't get the smell out. My, my wife loves it when I tell this story. So now anytime we're in the car and we drive anywhere and we smell something that ain't quite right, I look over, I'm like, honey, you think there's a bag of dog crap in the back? <laughs> Here's some truth. Situations in life, they have the ability to cloud the way that we look at future circumstances. And some of us, we're allowing past experiences with one or two individuals to shade every individual that's currently in our life. We find ourselves in situations with, with friends and coworkers and family members and, and our kids. When things don't go the way that we expect them to go, we're like, what's that smell? A bag of crap somewhere. And figuratively in our lives, maybe there is a past pain, a hurt, an open wound, a situation that you walked through that's affecting the way that you see the situation you're into today. There's something left in the trunk. And so every relationship in our life is at a, at a trust deficit. So we wonder why people don't try all that hard because they have to work so hard just to get up to zero. We start them in the negative because of what someone else did in our lives. Can I encourage you with something? Don't hold every relationship in your life hostage to what somebody did to you somewhere back in your past. That's why our J groups are so important and vital for us when growing in our faith and get around some people that can help us be the men and women of God that God's created us to be. It's why we have freedom groups to help you find healing for your hurt and your hang up so you can find real freedom. Get into a group that'll help you learn what it means to extend trust, trust in God, and extend trust in others. And not only do I need to learn to extend trust, but I also need to learn what it means to be a trustworthy person. You see, it's a, it's a two-way street, right? I'm going to fill the gap with trust, but I'm also going to be trustworthy. Here's some truth for you. I create gaps in people's lives. You create gaps. We all create gaps. Here's how the, the writer Paul put it. He said, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious Standard. So why do we create gaps? Because we're human, because we're not perfect, because we fall short, because sometimes we forget. It's not always ill intent, right? Sometimes you run out of time. Sometimes circumstances change and the thing that you thought you were going to be able to come through on, you're not able to come through on anymore. But so to be a trustworthy person means this, not that I'm perfect, but when I create a gap, I own it. I own it. But before that there's ever an unmet expectation, I'm proactively going to that person and saying, hey, you know, I know you th I told you it was going to be this way and it ended up not going that way. I apologize. Here's the reason why. Don't worry about it. I'm going to fix this. Or maybe it's at work. Hey, boss, I want you to know I'm going to be 10 minutes late for work. I apologize. I didn't navigate the traffic properly. I'm usually an on-time on person. I want you to know that. I'm going to be there as soon as I can. This won't happen again. I own it. Or, hey, I know you got that email from me saying I was going to handle this situation, and I had the intention of handling this situation, and this is what happened. It's not a great excuse, but don't worry. I'm going to get it done today. I own it. That's how we fill the gap. That's how we say, you know what? I want to be a trustworthy person. That's trustworthiness. Are you with me? And here's the thing, when I've broken trust, it's not your responsibility to restore that trust, it's mine. 
when trust is at the core of our relationship, man, God can do incredible things in those relationships, but I have to be the one that owns my part of it. I have to say, you know what? Uh, in this relationship, I was the violator of trust. I'm gonna do everything I can to rebuild that responsibility. It's not the other person's responsibility, it's mine. I own it, I fill the gap. I become a trustworthy person. Trust is the core of healthy relationships. Writer in Proverbs, he wrote it this way. He said, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. In other words, he who's integrous, he who's trustworthy, they don't have to worry or stress about things. They don't have to be looking over their shoulders. Man, they walking with integrity. They're trustworthy. When trust is at the core of your relationships, God says, hey, you can walk securely. So if we're going to be fit for the fight, we've got to learn to, to trust outwardly. We extend trust to others. We focus inwardly uh, as we seek to become trustworthy. And finally, and most importantly, we turn our attention upwardly to God. The scripture in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Our trust in God, it lays the foundation for every relationship that we have. When we get to a place where we trust God, the Lord, with all of our heart, man, can I tell you, it puts all of our other relationships in right perspective. There was a season in my life, i got to be honest with you, where, where I didn't trust God with my whole heart. See, I didn't meet my wife Carrie until I was almost 30 years old when we got married. So there was this sing season of singleness where I thought, man, I'm going to lean on my own understanding. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out what the sp who the spouse is that I need for my life. I'm going to figure out what my future holds. And i got to be honest with you, I did some stupid stuff. I dated a bunch of girls. I, I, don't judge me. I would, I would go on a date with a girl in the morning sometimes just to pick up a different girl in the evening. I was an idiot. It's dumb. Some of the dumbest things I did in my life were during that season of singleness where I wasn't putting my trust completely in God. I was trying to find my own way. And here's what I, what I learned. This is what it taught me. It, said, it taught me this. It said, as long as I'm trying to find my own way and do it my own way, I could never find my way. And here's how the scripture continues. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. It wasn't until I said, God, you know what? I'm going to start trusting you with my whole heart, not just part of me, not just the part of me that went to church on the weekends, but the part of me that went out with my friends on Friday night. I'm going to give you my whole heart. I'm going to be the same person during the week when I'm at my job as I am when I go to church on Sunday. I'm going to trust you for my spouse. I'm going to trust you for my future. I'm going to start leaning into what you have for me and what you created me to do. I'm going to get plugged into a J group and get around some people, some other men of God that can help me become the men of God that you've called me to be. I'm going to serve on a team. Why? Because you showed us what it meant to serve, serving others even until death. You gave everything. So God, I'm going to give everything. I'm going to give you my whole heart. I'm going to put it all out there. And I love his promise that's attached to our action when we do that. And he will show you which path to take. You ever wonder, what if I put my trust completely in God? What would happen? You know, we think that we have control. We think that we can trust ourselves, but that's really not true, is it? When we trust God, He shows us the path to take. And that's His promise, right? He'll show you who you're supposed to marry. He'll show you the relationships in your life that really matter. If you're leaned in and you've given him all your heart, he'll show you the direction you're supposed to go for your future because he has a future for you.
There's no more wondering. There's no more worrying. We can walk securely because we've given our whole heart to God. And I believe that there's some of you in this room today, you struggle, you're struggling to trust God with all of your heart. You're worried about a situation at work and how it's gonna play out. You you're have anxiety around your marriage and what seems to be the direction it's going. You, you have fear for your future because you look at it and you think to yourself, man, it's just not as bright as I thought it was. You look at your finances and you're like, God, I don't know how I can trust you with this. I, I'm struggling every single month to make ends meet. And you're like, God, I don't know if I can trust you with all this. But what if, what if you made a decision and say, God, I'm going to put it all out there. I'm going to trust you with all of my heart. I'm going to put my boxing gloves on. I'm going to go to battle for my life. I'm going to focus on you and you only. I'm not going to get distracted by what's happening around me or in front of me, but I'm going to focus on you. God says, I'll show you the path to take. Because when we trust in the one above us, we can handle everything around us. So let me ask you, what's at the core of your relationships? Are you you're building it on what you feel? Are you building on it on what makes you happy? Are you building on it on what's in it for you? Or are you building them on trust? Because if you build them on trust, trust that looks outward, that, that trust that extends outward to other people, if trust that looks inward, trust that looks upwards towards God, guess what? You'll get the happiness you're looking for. You'll get the security that you're looking for. You'll get poured into. You'll get everything out of those relationships that you need as an individual. You'll get all those things that you're wanting, but you've got to change your focus. You've got to change your core. And build your relationships on trust and be a trustworthy person. And above all else, trust God with all your heart. If you needed that reminder today, I want to just pray with you. Would you just slip up your hand if you needed that reminder today? Yeah, yeah, all over the room. Let's turn our hearts toward God. Father, today, we look to you, God, and we recognize that it's not always easy to trust, to trust people who have hurt us, to trust ourselves. We don't always make the right decisions, God. And sometimes, Lord, it's just hard to trust you. Today, Lord, we pray that you give us strength, you give us faith, God, you give us an ability, God, to see what's unseen, to see, God, that you have a future for us, you have a plan for our lives, God, and that we can trust you with all of our heart. We can put our faith in you today. God, I pray you help every person in this room before they walk out of here to know that you're a God that they can trust. That each person in this room will, will seek to live a life that extends trusts, that seeks to become trustworthy and ultimately seeks to find their faith in you in every area of their life. And maybe you're in here today and you've never built your relationship with Jesus. And can I tell you, before you ever get in the ring of relationships, you've got to have a relationship with the trainer. Maybe you've never started at the base level of trusting Jesus with your life, placing your faith in him. This is what the Bible says, that we've all sinned. What does that mean? We've all messed up. We've all made a mistake. We've all missed the standard that God set for us. And the whole reason that Jesus came was to restore the relationship between him and us. See, Jesus, he was perfect, so he stood in for you because none of us are and gave his life for you. So if today's that day, the day that you want to put your faith in Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to pray this prayer with me. With no one looking around, eyes closed, pray this prayer. Pray it under your breath if you feel comfortable that way. Pray it however you want to pray, but believe it in your heart. The Bible says that belief is the beginning. Trust is the beginning. It says, whoever believes in me should not perish, but have everlasting life. Your first step is trusting him in this area. So pray this prayer with me. Father, today... 
I recognize that I'm not perfect, that I need a savior, that I need to put my trust in you with all my heart. And today I made that decision, God, to turn towards you and take that step, that action of putting my faith in your son who died on the cross for me. Now, if you made that decision in this room, no one looking around, would you just slip your hand up, put it up high in the air? Yeah, 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 awesome. Now, Journey, would you help me celebrate the decisions that were made in this place today? So good.